Okay, welcome everyone. I'll do the formal intro in just one moment. Again, my name is Nick. I'm the CEO for the uh, for Communication and Outreach at the Prince George's County Memorial Library System in Maryland. I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this uh, presentation full screen for you, and then I will start the formal intro and we'll be off for the races. Thanks so much for your patience. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's live virtual event with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. My name is Nick Brown, and I'm the COO for Communication and Outreach for the Library. We're so thrilled to have you here with us tonight for the kickoff event for Love Your Library Month. Here at Prince George's County Memorial Library System, we take a National Library Week to the max, and we make it a month-long celebration of all things that the library does and offers for the community. This is especially important right now as we are all in stay-at-home orders uh, locally in Maryland and in the DMV region. Um, we invite you to check out our website at pgcmls.info for all kinds of great online resources. Um, there are also additional temporary resources on there for folks who may, might not live locally where you can access things like Metropolitan Opera streams for free and many other great resources locally and nationally. So without further <laughs> ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Renata Chancellor. She is an associate professor at the Catholic University of America in the Department of Library and Information Science. Her activities include diversity and social justice, the impact of misinformation in society, human information behavior, access to legal information, copyright and intellectual property law, and library and information services to underserved populations. She holds a doctorate from the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as a uh, Master of Library and Information Science from UCLA as well as a bachelor's from Point Loma Nazarene College. Tonight, Dr. Chancellor will be speaking on E.J. Josie, transformational leader in the modern library profession. Dr. Chancellor just released a new biography about uh, E.J. Josie, and we look forward to learning from her tonight about how important uh, Mr. Josie was in transforming the field of librarianship in the United States. Thanks, Dr. Chancellor, for joining us. And if you have any questions, type them into the chat box, and we'll do a Q&A session at the end of the Hello, everyone, um, and thank you, Nicholas, for that wonderful welcome, and um, thank you for inviting me to come here to talk tonight. I always love to talk about this subject of E.J. Josie, and um, I will talk a little bit more about how I got into just studying about E.J. Josie. But I can't think of any other person who, um, in library history, that love their library more in keeping with the theme that Prince George County is doing for this particular month. One of the reasons why, uh, or I guess I should say the impetus for studying E.J. Josie um, really occurred when I was in library school um, at UCLA back in the early 2000s. And I was nearly completed, uh, I nearly completed the program and I hadn't heard about anyone of color anyone from a marginalized community who was represented um, for library and information science. So I was actually surprised um, the quarter before graduating that I stumbled across this person's name in a book in route to doing a paper uh, for a historical research methods course. And I stumbled across Josie and then I'm like, that name sounds kind of interesting. So I did a little bit re more research and I'm like, wow, okay, he, he did wonderful things in our profession. And so I was so excited about him and I decided to do a paper on him. And so just to fast forward years later, when I went back for my doctorate, I decided that um, one reason why I decided, well, I, I decided a couple of things. One, I realized just in practicing as a librarian that there weren't a lot of people of color or people who represented uh, from marginalized communities who were out there um, advocating for the profession, um, at least in my opinion. And I don't feel like there was a lot of research or documentation on the efforts of all marginalized uh, representatives um, to the profession. 
So one of the reasons that I decided to do a dissertation on Josie was because of this. And so um, this work, this book on, on EJ Josie is largely from my dissertation research, but I've expanded it quite a bit. I did quite a bit additional research to make it into a book. And so tonight I just wanna share with you a little bit about the history of Josie and why he's such a um, uh, influential, why he was such an influential figure in the American Library Association, uh, but also in society as well. So what we'll do tonight, we'll talk, uh, I'll give you a little bit of history um, about him, um, about his life, why he did the things that he did and why his story is so relevant today because it's very relevant today. And so, um, yeah, so let's just kind of get into it. But before I get into like his life, I want to talk a little bit about the methodology. Uh, usually I do that. I talk about the methodology at the end of the presentation, but this time I think it's important to just talk about the methodology specifically because, um, what I said, there, were, there are not very many people of color, people representatives from marginalized communities documented in library and information science history. So in the methodology, in order to, um, to do the book, um, I surveyed a lot of secondary sources. I also did considerable documentary research and I interviewed Josie several times as well as um, some of his contemporaries I conducted over 30 interviews uh, from colleagues, families, and friend, friends. Um, and I also went to kind of, um, you know, really like trace his life. I went back to his hometown. I went and met with his family, his, his friends, his contemporary. I visited his school. I, uh, I, I visited his church, which were so instrumental in and how he became a leader. Um, I also visited um, several archives. I spent many, many hours in, at the ALA archives in, uh, in, um, univer at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I spent quite a bit of time in the University of Pittsburgh ar um, archives. And Josie's papers are at North Carolina Central University in their School of Library and Information Science. I spent quite a bit of time there as well as well as Savannah State College archives and the State University of New York, where he spent quite a bit of his, his um, time. Now, you, you're probably saying that's a lot of work. Yes, indeed. It took a lot of work to actually put his life into a, a story that I think is very interesting and very, uh, like I said, inspiring and relevant to today. So I just didn't want to write about the great things about E.J. Josie. Many of you are from the library world, so you may have heard about him, but you may not have heard about all the wonderful things that he's done. Um, others of you are maybe not familiar with the library world, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, um, give you some um, context. And so because he is such a huge figure in the profession, I didn't really want to write a book just glorifying all the things that he did. I really wanted to capture the great things, the not so great things. And so one way to do that, I wanted to look at him as a leader. And so I, um, I borrowed this um, theoretical framework um, in terms of um, so that I could kind of measure him by just to see, you know, really, truly, was he an effective leader? I kind of think he was, but I need the documentation and I need the data to kind of support that. And so you, you and we have all know like wonderful leaders, leaders in our families, leaders in our community, leaders in the organizations where we work, um, and then leaders, you know, at the state and federal government. So we've all known leaders, good and bad. But, um, and so we, we kind of have a sense of what makes a great leader. But I really looked at Bernard Bass's theory as to what makes a good leader. And I looked at those four elements that you'll see here on this slide to, to measure Josie against to see was he an effective leader. And so, yeah, and so that was part of the reason why, um, that's a, a huge part of the reason why um, uh, I did so, so much extensive research looking for these elements 
to see um, if he was a leader, speaking to his friends, going to his hometown, looking at um, documenting, documentary evidence, looking at all those, um, all that data and then triangulating that to, to ascertain to see if he was an effective leader. So let's go back and talk a little about um, Josie in his early years because I find that he is a, a phenomenal person or he has a phenomenal history and you might find it very interesting those of you who are not familiar with his life. Um, so he was born in 1924 um, in um, North, Norfolk, Virginia, but he didn't stay there very long. He moved to Portsmouth, which is the other side of the Elizabeth River. I, you can see a map here that divides Portsmouth and Norfolk. So he, he his family, his parents moved um, to Portsmouth. Um, he was the eldest of five children and he graduated from IC Norcom High School. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, and one of the interesting things about um, Josie was that he was the oldest child, um, but he also, uh, I guess, bore the, uh, bore the brunt of, or wore the brunt of just being the leader of the family. Um, he was, in Portsmouth, he lived in a community called Mount Hermon, which is a very, very poor city. And as he says it, he, he talks about it being very much in poverty. Uh, often they didn't have a lot of, a lot to eat, a lot of clothes, um, to wear shoes. And so, but they were very poverty, but he always felt that they were always rich because his mother always um, made the children feel like they were rich and ed with education and poetry and song and music. So although they didn't have the physical things, they he felt that he had the intellectual things. So um, that's kind of like sets, sets up his early life. And on the next slide, you'll see um, a picture of the library, the segregated library that Josie was allowed to go to in 1939 when he was 15 years or so. And so this library, obviously, um, during that particular time, it was segregated because think about what was going on in the country. Um, it we were right during the whole high period of Jim Crow and segregation. And so this is the only library that he could actually go to. This particular building now is deemed a historical site and a resource center right in Portsmouth. Um, so it's still there. It doesn't look like this now, but it still exists. And so this is another thing that kind of... Um, kind of bothered him. He actually didn't feel like he was able to go to a library and get a lot of resources until he went into the military. He attended IC Norcom High School, which is uh, which was a segregated school at the time. Here you see a picture of um, the high school on the left here, on to my left here, um, during the 1920s. And to the right, you'll see a, 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 ch a childhood picture of Josie. Um, he's the one in the back with the arrow, the arrow pointed towards him. So he attended I.C. Norcom High School. Now, I.C. Norcom was a historical, very well-known figure in his own right um, within the city of Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, he was one of the first Blacks um, from, the t from the community to go and get his Harvard educated, went to Yale. And so he did all these wonderful things in terms of education. And so they named the high school after him. And I would have to say as well that my when I visited um, Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, again, it was it's a very poor community. Um, and when I visited, you can still see elements of that today, even in the 21st century. Um, but a lot of the members from the community were, you know, rose up from the community and were able to do great things. A lot of them are educators, a lot of them both at, you know, the um, secondary level as well as for um, higher education at universities. A lot of them are professional, doc went on to be doctors, lawyers. So I think it says a lot about that community, um, even though it was very poor and they didn't have a lot of uh, money financially, they were able to, um, they actually, had this great sense of family, a sense of community, and they looked out for each other. And so a lot from the community were able to be um, successful in their own right. Now, 
I see Norcom High School, um, the, the picture here on this particular site, you see, if you look clear, closely to the picture, this was dated in 1973. So they were still having, in 1973, post-Civil Rights Movement, they were still having, um, 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 you know, um, riots for and fighting for, you know, Segregate, um, desegregation, even in 1973. So I think that speaks to the community there. So um, as far as, and my research showed that um, even pushing towards the 80s, they were still they were still having a lot of issues with um, racism in that particular community. The next slide um, talks is, is basically in Josie's own words, and you can find us from page 27 of my book. And he talks, as I mentioned earlier, he talks about why he didn't feel rich, uh, um, poor, and why he felt rich in so many ways. And his mother was really instrumental in that. And I, I like to say as well, his other four siblings, they also went on to do really great things. His sister was in the went on to do um, rise really high in the military, um, and she was in education, as well as his brothers as well. So they all did very well even though they often didn't have a lot. And one example that I'd like to share with you that I didn't really put in the book, but I think it's a metaphor for how Josie lived his life and why he fought for a lot of things that he did. One of the stories that one of his childhood friends told me when I was visiting Portsmouth a few years ago was that um, there, um, Josie and his his family were coming home um, and their house was foreclosed on and he was very upset about it. And so he took a brick from the ground, from the, um, just from the front of the house and threw a brick towards the window out of frustration. And so um, he, you, I believe that he used that, that anger towards all the inequities that he faced uh, when he was younger to really fight for a lot of um, social justice in his career. Now, his father died when he was 16. So being the eldest son, he, he graduated early from high school and he went to take little odd jobs around town. He was um, very um, musically inclined. He played the organ at churches. And so he did that for a job for work during that particular time and so um so he graduated early he took job he took work to help the family um he also joined the military in 1943 um and then the military his time in the military as he speak was a real turning point for him um, for two reasons one of the reasons that was that um it was while he was in the military that he was able to really go to a library that was not segregated and he felt that he was really astounded by the type of resources that were available to him. And then the other thing that really, um, he says, propelled him to fight for social justice was that occurred um, when he was coming back on the bus in one of his, on one of his tours and the white bus driver told him to, you know, step aside and let the, um, the other white pa uh, white soldiers come before him, but Josie refused to do that. And when he refused to do that, the bus driver took out a gun and pointed it at Josie, and and then kind of like pushed him aside. But he said, you know, he was willing to die because he felt like he did not want to be considered a second class citizen. Those are his words. So, and he said from that particular point, he would never back down for, to any injustice. So, um, so that was really key and instrumental in his, in his life. Um, the military provided an opportunity for him to attend college. I'm not sure many of you are familiar with the GI Bill, but the GI Bill for soldiers, if you serve in the military um, and you're discharged, honorably, then you get certain um, financial rewards. For example, you can you, you can use money to go to college. You can you, they give you money to buy a house, uh, property, 
things such as that. So because of his service in the military, when he got out in 1946, he was able to go to college. So he used that to go to college. And so um, what he did was he went to Howard University uh, where he um, studied. He wanted to major in music, but he eventually changed his major. So he stayed, he, 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 uh, he was at Howard for four years. And after Howard, he still had money on his um, GI account. So he took another year and got a master's in history. So, and then he eventually went on to Columbia University where he um, actually worked in the journalism library while he was a student. And that's what inspired him to go to library science. And he, he, attend, he went to library school at the State University of New York. One of the things that um, the military really spoke to him was that he felt that, and I um, have this quote um, by A. Philip Randolph, um, because he felt that as a soldier and what they coined during that time called the double V campaign, this is when um, black soldiers were able to travel, go fight for World War II in Germany or in France or wherever the soldiers, the units were, and they didn't ex experience any type of racism, discrimination there. And so they kind of lived a life where they felt like they were, you know, Americans and they were treated fairly. However, once the war ended and they had to come back to the States, they actually, they felt that discrimination again. So there is a whole, um, if anyone's interested in that type of research, there's a whole I, whole concept called the double V campaign, where um, Josie feels that felt that that was really um, a big part for, that he felt that you know very viscerally, and he did not want didn't think that was fair. So this slide just gives you the um, the quote in this on of Josie and when he was in the military and when he refused to um, stand, when, when he stood his ground. So let's speak to his, a little bit of his professional career. So I did, I tell you, he got his BA in music from Howard University. And then he went on and got his master's in history at Columbia and then his master's in library science at SUNY. His first job, so his first job um, as a librarian. So he graduated. He was excited about graduating. So his first, his first job was at the Free Library of Philadelphia in 1953. Um, he only stayed there one year because he felt that there was su such um, harsh discrimination there. He was one of the few librarians who had a library science degree, but they kind of denigrated him and it made him want to leave the profession altogether. So he left library science altogether. And then he went to um, Savannah State College and he taught in the history department for a year. But while he was there, he decided, oh, I miss library science. I wanna go back. I want, I wanna become a librarian. So he did that. And then um, he also went on to become director of the Delaware State College Library and the De Delaware, um, the Savannah State College Library as well. Some of his other achievements later on in life was that he became the chief director of the uh, Bureau of New York Department of, Life of Education. It's there where he pretty much established the New York system uh, interlibrary loan consortium system. And this is back in the 1960s. So those are people who are very familiar with interlibrary loan. Um, Josie basically did that for um, New York. Those of us who are in DC, we probably are familiar with the WRLC, the World uh, Research Library Consortium. It's very similar to that. So he was instrumental in basically in establishing that for the New York system in 1996. Um, his last professional position was uh, when he was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and he did quite a few things there in terms of just recruiting a lot of people of color to the profession, as well as international students. University of, University of Pittsburgh is known for, um, in the 80s, being one of the few, if not the only library science program that had the highest number of um, library students in general, and, and more specifically, library students of color. 
So let's talk a little bit about um, the next slide gives just gives you a picture of the Free Library of Philadelphia in 1927. In 1927, so it gives you an idea of you know where he was working at the Free Library of Philadelphia. The slide after that um, talks shows shows you a picture of Josie while he was at Savannah State when he was director of the library system. Uh, um, when he was director of the library at Savannah State College Library. He was also um, the faculty advisor for the NAACP. Now, he was at Savannah State from 1959 to 1966. That was a crucial period in American history because that was during the period of the Civil Rights Movement. And he was instrumental with helping students and pushing students out to do a lot of the sit-ins, um, to do a lot of the protests during that particular time. And so this is just a picture that shows you uh, um, some of his acti activities during um, his time there, which all leads up to his whole, the, I guess the core of his, of his advocacy of ALA during um, that particular um, period in time. He is known for his activism in ALA on a lot of different levels, not only just fighting for rights for Blacks and African Americans, um, um, but just women, other um, marginalized groups as well. And so I want to spend a lot of time, a little bit of time talking about his activism in the American Library Association, because this is really what, what he's really known for. So, what he's most known for occurred in 1964. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of history. You guys, 1964 stands out in American history because that was during a time that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, this was after many um, decades of oppression. And so, what Jesse is um, one of his you know, most notable actions or um, points of advocacy occurred in 1964. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of history, the American Library Association is a national library association. So they pride themselves on being democratic and open and free to everyone. And that's basically, basically on their guidelines and their principles. And, and so they're, they pride themselves on being open to everyone. However, during the period of civil rights, and even before then, um, Jim Crow laws really prevailed in all over the, the country, but primarily in the, in the South. And so, um, so where there were, weren't a lot of issues in terms of like having like people of color active in the state library association, say for example, in California Library Association, while there was discrimination there, there um, they were treated fair, pretty much fairly in terms of being allowed to be members of the organization. Whereas in Savannah or in Georgia or Alabama or Louisiana, Blacks could not even be members to these state associations. So if you're from DC, like we have DCLA, District Columbia Law, uh, Library Association, um, back during this period of time, Blacks may or may not have been allowed to be members based on that. So that kind of bothered Josie, having been in Savannah in Georgia where he could not be a member of the uh, Georgia Library Association. And, he's, and he talks about sending a letter and sending his membership dues um, um, to them and they returning it to him. This also happened to Clara Stanton Jones, who was the first black um, president of the American Library Association. She sent her membership dues as well and they returned them to her. So this bothered him. And this also comes from 1936 when the American Library Association held their first um, annual meeting in Richmond, Virginia, and they wanted to be inclusive of, to everyone. So they sent out all these notifications, encouraging everyone to attend, especially Blacks to attend the association. However, back to Richmond, 
they um, blacks could not go into the hotel rooms. They could not be fully participate in the conference because of rich uh, Virginia's laws of segregation. So it was in 1936 that the very first resolution was passed that the American Library Association would no longer hold events in um, cities where um, they discriminated. The ALA never did anything on the issue of race from 1936 until 1964, and that bothered Josie. So it was in 1964 where they had their annual conference and he was just really upset. And actually the timing really worked well for him because it, it really coincided with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And he, and he um, basically introduced a resolution that said um, the state library associations, state associate, associations like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia can't be members of the National American Library Association until they start allowing membership to everyone. And so um, so he introduced his, his resolution and it was seconded. And then as Josie said, after that, all hell broke loose. And I can imagine it did. Those of us who have been to these American Library Association conference council meetings, we, have, we probably have an idea of how it went. But he's known for introducing this resolution and actually passing it. So shortly after resolu the resolution passed, still some of the associations were slow, very reluctant to allowing membership to all. But slow, slowly, by, um, slowly, they all began to, you know, um, abide by the policy, and they started allowing members into these state associations. So Josie, so that was his activism on that level, but it never, it didn't stop there because as we know in, in, in life, passing, having laws don't get rid of the racism or the discrimination. So um, what he did in 1970, he founded the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And this came out of um, Blacks congregating to these ALA annual meetings and commiserating with the experiences that they had in work on the job. Um, for example, you know, the discrimination that they, that they experienced while working in libraries on the job, and so they would commiserate. So Josie saw that there was a need, Josie and several others saw that there was a need to form a, an association specifically do, dealing with black um, library, issues of black librarians. And basically what that did was, it was very significant because in 1970, he founded the Black Caucus, I believe in 1971, where FORMA was founded. That's the um, Association for Spanish Speaking. And then after that, APALA, the Asian Pacific Association, Library Association was founded. And then all these other uh, library associations were founded after that. Um, and so that was significant. This is why we have all these ethnic library associations today. So he became president in, of, the, of ALA in 1984. Now, imagine pushing that resolution through. Imagine fighting for a Black caucus within American Library Association. And while that was great for the Black librarians and other librarians who were progressively, uh, who, who thought, um, who were progressive, um, but there are other people who were against it as well. But even though um, Josie was the type of person that he had his mind, he really was able to push through um, his agenda. And so um, he became president of the American Library Association in 1984. And it was, it was in 1984 that he um, really instituted a lot of policies to uh, for equal pay for women at that particular time, as well as he in 1984, he took the first delegation to outside. Um, um, he had an ALA IFLA, the International Federal Library Association, um, joint conference in Kenya. So he did a lot during that particular time because he was not only fighting discrimination in America, he was also fighting apartheid during that time um, in Africa. So he married those two interests in that in that area. Um, again, like I said, he advocated for equal pay and he was authoring a lot of a lot of books on these issues so josie just didn't like 
fight for these issues and become like a heckler to ALA when they were slow or reluctant to deal with a lot of these issues, similar to today. But he also wrote about it. And he also collaborated with the editor of the library journal at that time, who was Eric Moon. Um, so he would just write articles and he would write about all the issues that were going on within the library world. So he received a number of honors, including the, AL, the highest um, level of ALA honorary membership. Um, he received numerous awards. Um, there is an ALA Spectrum um, scholarship named after him. He received several honorary doc, um, um, doctorates. He actually pushed through the library world and got a lot of coverage in mainstream America. He was profiled in Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine on the issues that he fought for. So he did a lot in terms of just raising the profile of librarians and also just being, you know, um, just holding ALA to their, um, to their ideals that they set for themselves. So he was really big on that. So what does that mean today? So Josie, during a particular time that he was in Savannah, he, like I said, he, he um, was the advisor for the NAACP. I can see him today fighting for a lot of the issues that are going on now. And, and as a matter of fact, in our last interview, which um, was in, I think it was 2008, he really, he, um, he was very ill at the time. And he said he had another good book in him that he wanted to write. And he wanted to talk about a lot of the issues that were going on today. I can't imagine, like, I can only imagine fast forward to 2020 where there's a lot of issues uh, that we're still dealing with in the 1960s. There's still um, uh, police brutality. There's still extreme racism. There's still discrimination. Um, there's still this lack of diversity. And it's not only just for, and when I say diversity, I'm not just talking about ethnicity, I'm talking about race, I'm talking about ability, I'm talking about sexual orientation, I'm talking about all these issues that still exist today um, that Josie would be fighting for. And so we're still dealing with in the in the library profession dealing with, um, should we allow hate groups come into the library? These issues are still prevalent today. Um, and so I can see, I feel like the Josie's model, there is a need for, you know, his type of voice today. Um, to be like an angst to ALA and to other people within the profession. And so um, I think I just want to pause there and see if there are any questions that um, you may have regarding Josie. Thank you so much, Dr. Chancellor. That was a really great talk. And uh, I think all of our audience uh, very much enjoyed learning about uh, this pioneer who's had a tremendous, tremendous uh, impact, uh, not just on the field of librarianship, but uh, really on American history, even though he might not be known as a mainstream figure now, but it's clear from the coverage that he had um, when he was at his peak professionally uh, in Ebony Magazine and such that he was a, a force to be reckoned with and a, and a change maker for good. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and type those into the chat box here on Crowdcast. If you are watching through Facebook or YouTube, please go ahead and post your questions there and I'll be checking each platform periodically. Um, so the first question that we have is, uh, did you say that in 1976, blacks could not stay in hotels in Richmond? No, I did not say 76, I said in 1930, 1936. 1936, we was in um, coincided with the ALA conference in Richmond, Virginia. So it was 1936. Great, thanks for clarifying. Um, awesome talk. Thank you to that the person who said that. Uh, congratulations on the publication, Dr. Chancellor. Greetings from one of your former students. Um, the next question is, how did he inspire in librarianship? Though though we find he though we find him that he studied history, music, and so on. So how did um, he come to be uh, a, li a librarian based on the fact that he had such a different, uh, disparate path, which many of us have had very uh, similar paths where we've been all over the place and um, the values that cross these different disciplines actually all 
roads lead to librarianship? Great question. Well, the great thing about um, the field is that it's very interdisciplinary. And what I mean by that is that it intersects with communications, technology, music, sociology, psychology. And so for Josie, he was actually working in the music library. His love was music, so he was working in music library when um, he was in school. And so he met someone named Basil Miller who said, wow, you're great at this library thing. Why don't you go get a library science degree? And so that's really how he um, was led to library science from there. Great. Yeah. Um, we have another question, which is uh, from Lee. Do you think his military career shaped his ability to navigate ALA away from discriminatory practices? If so, how? Yes, I do think his military career in terms of, yes, because um, just in knowing him and just talking to the people who knew him, he was very, very strict. He was very, maybe the military um, provided him with to be very detail oriented, very discipline oriented. And so he's very persistent as well. So I heard a lot of stories from him or for people who knew him, people that he mentored about how focused he was and how um, strategic he was in into getting his agenda around. He was, I, he was a fascinating leader who was not, he was able to really make that great balance between really getting his agenda through, but also do it in such a way whereby, you know, it wasn't offensive to everyone. And he was able to pull people into his vision. So absolutely, I definitely think that um, his military um, training and career in impacted him. Great, thank you. Um, to Stephanie, who's watching on YouTube, thanks for your comment. Um, we are definitely going to be posting this video onto the YouTube channel uh, as soon as the event is done. So you'll be able to rewatch and um, this will be available for folks to watch in the future, which is really great. Um, we have a new comment and also uh, two que another question. So this is a comment from Virginia. I'm very excited to know about this event. Dr. Josie was one of my mentors in ALA, Virginia B. Ginny Moore. Congratulations on your book and fun <laughs> contribution to knowledge about African-Americans. That's awesome. So uh, this is just a great example of how we can use opportunities like coming together virtually across the country um, to really shed light on some amazing topics and to, to reconnect. And that's pretty remarkable that we're able to have one of Dr. Josie's or yep, um, Dr. Josie's mentees on. Um, I think that's really spectacular. Um, and then we have Linda who's saying hi to uh, Ginny from Linda White, so hi, hi Linda. Um, we also have a poll up for you if you want to do some interactive work here on the Crowdcast stream, if you're watching directly on Crowdcast. Um, the poll question is, did you know who EJ Josie was prior to this talk, yes or no? If you wanna fill that out, that'd be great to help us learn more about your interests. Um, here's another question from Lee. Can you discuss more about Josie's role in mentoring other African-American librarians? Sure. Um, yes, he was instrumental. And in, first of all, he was very, he felt very passionate about working at HBCUs. He actually worked at several of them, um, Delaware State, um, Savannah State. And he actually worked a lot in terms of working with other HBCUs that he didn't work at, like say North Carolina Central. He was really good in terms of, um, recruiting African-Americans to the professional library science because he, he saw that there was a need, there was a gap there, not only just for the master's degree, but also for the PhD. He also continued that role when he was a professor at University of Pittsburgh in terms of mentoring junior faculty to help them get tenure um, and just to help them get through the process. So he was very instrumental in that. Um, and I do know he not only just at Pittsburgh, but he would do it like he had so much energy. <laughs> he was able to like network with other people across the world. Like I talked to people from California who when California was dealing with their issues with librarians during the 1970s, I believe he was able to help work with them and lend his voice to them to, you know, help them out and to deal with some of the discrimination that they were dealing with. So he was really, he had a lot of energy. 
he was always a voice. He was he had like a huge network of people that he can pull for from not only just African Americans but other African Americans. And he had the ear to people who were high up um, in the field, and so he was able to use his pulpit, so to speak, to like help people out in, in that regard. And just like his 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 unbelievable. Um, persistence and his vision to kind of, you know, and to stick to his vision to see things through. Awesome. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, it's from Elizabeth who asks, did Dr. Josie come across as angry with all of the injustice he saw in the libraries? Uh, can you repeat that, Nick? Sure. The question is from Elizabeth. Did Dr. Josie come across as angry with all of the injustice he saw in the libraries? Oh, great question, Elizabeth. Um, I'm pretty sure some people perceived him as being angry. Um, that's very common for black people who, um, who have a vision and who seem, who are confident. So a lot of people who are not black may perceive them to be angry. So I have no data on that, but I just have a personal experience that I'm pretty sure that, you know, but for some, he was considered angry. Um, but, um, just me knowing, talking to him and his colleagues, he was he was very focused on the agenda. It was never a personal thing for him. He saw injustice, so he wanted to fight for justice. So it was never like, you know, anger. And, and I, I'm sure he angered people. Um, some of you guys in the library world may be familiar with Judy Krug, who was very instrumental with censorship. Uh, she's a huge figure in her own right in terms of Van Book Week and all these things uh, for ALA and time censorship. They actually did not get along very well. They, because of issues that you might want to read in, in the book, I talk about the, there is a film called The Speaker that was very controversial during that time that portrayed Blacks in a very negative way. And Judy Krug, who, who was an advocate for censorship, felt that there was nothing wrong with what the 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 the, the, mo the film whereas Josie felt that there wasn't there was a lot wrong with it so they but had so he was a, with a lot of people and like I said I don't have any data to say if he was considered perceived to be angry but I wouldn't be surprised great thank you um we've had a few more people fill out the poll so far we have 70 percent who had prior knowledge about ej josie and 30 percent who did not have prior knowledge so we're glad that um, we're able to reach some new folks and if you haven't filled out the the poll yet please go ahead and do that if you're watching on crowdcast uh, we have a few more comments and questions coming in uh thanks so much for participating everyone uh, linda mentions that she is a former spectrum scholar and retired school librarian also a cua grad go catholic university uh -huh. I'm also an alumni, um, and that you are grateful for all of Josie's work. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Elizabeth says, hi, Dr. Chancellor, great talk. Uh, Josie seemed like someone who stirred things up. Can you speak in more detail about any other challenges or controversies he faced over his career, similar to the 1970 ALA resolution? Okay, so you mean personal challenges that he, yeah, he did definitely stir things up. Um, there was a time, like, he, like I, I mentioned before about the whole international apartheid. He was always on the steps of Washington, fighting, working with, um, at the time was, um, at the time in DC, there was like a DC policy office. It's, it was called, um, the actual name escapes me now, but he was always working with Congress in order to impact change and so he was known for um and he and actually there was major owens who was a congressman in from D, in dc who was originally from new york who he worked with he was all he was also a librarian and so josie and him would actually uh, collaborate on a lot of their initiatives for a lot of the policy initiatives so he was frequently in dc area fighting congress on a lot of these issues which is why he became so popular also, in terms of like apartheid, not only did he um, work with students to kind of like do protests, he actually protested himself. And again, so during the, there was a, I believe it was like in the early 80s, there was a, um, a, a, a protest, protest march whereby he actually had a sign was holding up, you know, protesting apartheid. 
He was also very active in the NAACP outside of library science. So while he was in New York, because he was um, at the Chief Bureau of New York for about 20 years, he was also very active in their NAACP program. So he dealt with a lot of issues outside of library science as well. So he had his hands in a lot of a lot of different things, but it was all centered on one issue was um, social justice and um, human rights. Great, thank you. Um, we had another comment that said, this was an awesome presentation, Dr. Chancellor. Thanks so much for tuning in everyone. Um, and we have another comment from Lisa Struthers who says, I remember Dr. Josie as a very engaged professor as a student of his at University of Pittsburgh. I learned a lot in his class. Thanks for sharing that anecdote. Uh, then we have a question from Nirmal who asks, can you give some tips on how young librarians can carry on his legacy again? Did I lose the feed? Hello. Hello. Hi, Nick. I didn't hear the last part of your oh, question. The question. Oh, sure, I'll repeat the question. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? It's a little choppy, but yes. Okay. Do you have any tips on how young librarians can carry on Dr. Josie's legacy and what the departments and the schools can do? Oh, wow. So many things, right? So for young librarians, I would encourage you to get involved with the Black Caucus of the American Library Association because they're doing a lot of initiatives in terms of like um, helping issue, helping deal with issues that are specifically unique to Black librarians. Um, I would also say that um, you can work on committees within ALA as well. Just make yourself visible. Because that's one of the things that Josie, Josie did well. Not only was he a member of the Black Caucus, but he was a member of ALA Council. He was a member of all these different groups. IFLA, he, you know, became so knowledgeable about a lot of different areas. So even though people that may not have liked him, they respected him. So my advice would be to really just get, get out there, get yourself involved, and don't just limit yourself to just one area. Just try to, um, you know, really put yourself into a lot of different areas. Now, in terms of the schools, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting your question like in library science programs in terms of um, learning about Josie or talking about Josie. One of the reasons why, and Nick, you probably could attest to this, one of the reasons why I developed this luminary assignment for my foundation's course in library and information science was because when I was in library school, I didn't hear about black librarians, Hispanic librarians, Asian librarians. I didn't hear about that. I heard it just about the, you know, the Melvin Dewey, Melville Dewey's and the John Cutters, you know. And I thought that was important. So library science programs need to do more in terms of incorporating these issues into their curricula. I think that's really important. I also think that it can be, there probably needs to be something done on the ALA accreditation level as well. Um, there are some programs who are offering like um, courses on social justice and things like that, but um, Whenever I get an opportunity in my courses, not just the foundations course, I try to incorporate, um, help students learn, get a broader view or broader picture of the full picture of our library history. Great, thank you. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great, I'm trying out the, the headset now. Um, thank you so much for that answer. Um, the next comment is uh, another anecdote. I hear my experience of him was not as angry, but as strong and a promoter of equal rights for African-Americans. Thanks so much, Lisa, for that. Um, and then another comment from Nirmal. Thanks for a great sharing. I look forward to learning about him and his legacy. Transformational library leadership is very important and needed in the digital world. Um, this is from Nirmal, who is also a CUA alum. Great. Okay. And uh, we have another question to the question box. Um, the question is, uh, starts with a comment. Anger is a natural reaction to racism. Thanks, Dr. Chancellor. Did Josie have any relationships with other noted civil rights activists? Did Josie, I, I didn't hear the last part. Have a relationship with other noted civil rights activists? Great question. Um, yes, he actually, I wouldn't say it was a relationship, but he did tell me that he had dinner with Martin Luther King. He was influenced by him. He was inspired by him um, during that particular time. Um, 
he also was um he was also inspired by other people who were maybe not considered civil rights activists, but like in the fight for civil rights, people, you know, um, people like James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, and, and those celebrities as well who were fighting for issues of, of civil rights in their own right. Great, thank you. So this is the last call now for questions. Oh, here's another comment. So last call for questions and I'll read this comment. Um, this is from Kathleen. Thanks for submitting. Um, E.J. Josie's President's Committee, co-chaired by Elizabeth Martinez and Vinnie Tate Wilkin, submitted the report, Equity at Issue, Library Services to the Nation's Major Minority Groups in 1985. I think this report changed the profession at its core, but I think it is not well known today. I am glad you are bringing this to attention for a new generation. Thanks so much for sharing that comment, and I'll let Dr. Chancellor chime in. Yeah, thank you. That was a great comment. Actually, I know Benny Tate Wilkins um, from my days in California. So I think she lives out of state now. But yeah, she, she, she's done a lot in terms of fighting for civil rights. And I actually interviewed her for the book. So um, yeah, so thank you very much for that comment. Great. One more shot, a last call on questions if anyone's got them. Uh, we put a second poll up that was, uh, do you or did you work in libraries? 100% of respondents said yes. So we are reaching the target audience tonight. We are really excited about that. Um, and oh, you're welcome. Someone uh, near Mall said thank you to the host. I appreciate that. Um, thanks to everyone who has participated in our Q&A. This has been the liveliest Q&A since we've started doing virtual events uh, at PGC MLS. So we really, yeah. yeah. Um, it's really great. It means that we're reaching a really committed audience and uh, we thank everyone for, for joining us. So um, a few PSAs before we wrap. Um, if you are interested in reading Dr. Chancellor's book, um, we recommend that you either uh, consider buying it or you can uh, see if it's available through your local library. Um, it is published by an academic imprint, so it might be harder to find at your local public library. Uh, but the best thing to do is if you want to read this and you want your local library to get it for you is to go onto your library's website and find where you can submit a suggestion for acquisition. This is something that we have with PGCMLS. If you go to pgcmls.info, if there's a book that you want to read um, that the library doesn't have already, you can make that suggestion. It's really our jobs now to, to, to do what we can to um, purchase books based on what the patrons or what the customers are seeking. And if we're not able to purchase a book for one reason or another, whether it's budget or um, timing issues, uh, we all have interlibrary loan. So for example, here in Maryland, um, the University of Maryland has a copy already. This is a pretty new book. So our library system would be able to borrow from University of Maryland to make it available to you. It's also available um, in certain ebook ebook platforms too, especially if you've got an academic library um, affiliation. So you can check that out. Um, before we do final thoughts, I um, just want to give you a rundown of our virtual events that are on the calendar tomorrow. Um, we appreciate that we have a lot of folks from outside of the area on here tonight um, and want to make sure that you know that we've got programming for you every day for every age group uh, while we're in the closure here. And I had a list and I wrote it down, but oh, there it is. I put it in front of my face. <laughs> so uh, this is the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. We're a public library uh, county system in Maryland in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. We're the uh, second largest county in the state of Maryland. We have almost a million uh, Prince Georgians, as we're called here. And it's a really uh, thriving and vibrant community. Uh, many federal workers, many people who work in the nonprofit sector, public service. Uh, our library has 19 branches, uh, including uh, one of our branches that was named the Library Building of the Year uh, for 2018, which is our new Laurel branch, which is pretty exciting. Um, and so connect with us all the time. We're a great system. I'm, I, I'm totally biased, but you're the captive audience, so you have to listen to it right now. <laughs> um, and so our lineup for virtual events tomorrow morning uh, starts with a uh, live virtual read aloud at 10 o'clock. We'll have a guest speaker from the County Human Relations Commission. At 11 o'clock, we'll have another read aloud with a guest from the Prince George's County Police Department, Ms. Renee. At 12 o'clock, we have a, a live PGCMLS book chat on Twitter. So if you are a bookish type, come hang out with us on Twitter tomorrow at noon. And if you play your cards right, you can also figure out that you can chat with the DC library folks at the same time as chatting with us. So they have a different topic tomorrow. We all talk now, great. Uh, then at two o'clock, we'll be doing a demo of Mango Languages where you can learn foreign languages for free or learn English if you're a, a non-English speaker. 
And then at four o'clock, our CEO, Roberta Phillips, is hosting a community conversation. Uh, it's just going to be an open Q&A where you can uh, ask questions about the library and uh, talk with Roberta about how the community is mobilizing to support each other right now. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention to you before we officially wrap um, is that today is National Census Day. And the census is super important for many, many reasons. Since most of you seem to work in libraries already, you all know that, and I'm preaching to the choir. But um, this is the first year with online completion, and that worked out very well considering that we're all at state, in stay-at-home orders now. Um, it takes two seconds if you have a smaller household to uh, fill this out online, or you can also call in and do it over the phone. Uh, you can visit my2020census.gov, and literally you can do it in two minutes. And in our county here locally, each household that completes the census is actually responsible for directly bringing in $18,250 in federal funding to the county for everything that we benefit from for that entire period um, over 10 years. So it is a hugely important thing to do. Here in Prince George's County, we were undercounted by 30% last time. That means that we lost out on 30% of the federal funds that we should have gotten for everything from uh, public safety to education to libraries to roads. Um, so it has a tremendous impact on your local communities. Please, please, please fill it out. Um, if you are so excited about filling it out like I am, post something on social media, use the hashtag proud to be counted, and we'll be happy to share that on the library's platforms. So final word will go to Dr. Chancellor. Dr. Chancellor, please tell us um, what your advice is for how we can um, live Dr. Josie's legacy on a day-to-day -day basis, whether we work in libraries or not. Well, I think um, what you can do is live life boldly, live life fiercely, um, fight for what you believe in, um, be kind, because he really was a kind person as well. But um, just really just, I can't, I guess I'll leave it at that. I, I just live life boldly, because that's really what he did. And he did not back down for the thing from the things that he believed in and i think that's why he was able to become so successful in what he did awesome that is really fabulous and i've quoted you in the chat and we'll put that onto twitter right now um and we also have uh, additional greetings from elizabeth who is a colleague at pgcmls great to see you virtually and uh she's a, a current student at catholic university so this is a great uh, convening of of connections. And uh, thank you again to all of you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Chancellor, for a wonderfully enlightening conversation. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Please continue to follow Prince George's County Memorial Library System. We are at PGCMLS on social media. We also have a great new Spanish page. Um, if you go to uh, facebook.com slash Biblioteca de Prince George, and we look forward to seeing all of you online, hopefully tomorrow, if not another day. Uh, and if you have questions about anything whatsoever, feel free to let us know uh, on social media or via email or by phone, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.